All right. So yeah, I was I was planning on wrecking uh, earlier. Uh, you know, in, in the in the concept of the of the uh, the, the children's sermon, but Luca Luca helped me. And he, he he got ahead of the game on that one. And I didn't catch what your name was. Kayla. Leela. Leela did a great job of helping him back up. That was really cool. And and my other friend here did a great job. Kiari. All right, did a great job of helping me. So um, that that sets the stage for for where we are headed. But I want to get there a little a little differently. So so who here has ever signed up for something, joined something, or committed to something, expecting one experience? And yet, once you were there, once you were in it, it, that experience, was very different than what you thought it would be. Anybody ever have that, have that happen to them? Would anybody be willing to share what that experience was that they, that they thought would be different? Yeah, Bill. Yes, I put my kids into uh, Cub Scouts when they were little, okay. expecting that they would learn about the outdoors and crafts and things like that. And it turned out they were just selling candy bars and bags of popcorn. Okay, so yeah, so sometimes uh, you know when you expect one thing, it turns into a fundraising experience. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that is very true. And and I also have have had the opposite experience too, where where I I took uh, um, I you know I, I I had a kid come in from uh, Boy Scouts, and I hadn't always had the best experience with Boy Scouts. And this kid was tremendous, you know, over the top, you know, in his leadership. So, you know, it kind of goes both, you know, both ways, you know, of, you know, expectations. What else? What else have you had expectations of? Or, or you thought would happen one way, but happen another? Yeah. I went on a men's retreat thinking it was going to be a relaxing weekend. <laughs> and you kind of find out it was like one of the most intense God experiences that I ever had. Okay, so you went on retreat, expecting retreat, yeah, and, and you came upon a life-changing experience that was probably draining and fulfilling both. Oh, yeah. And I'm not looking for anything in particular. I'm just curious what people what people have run into. Yeah. Coming home after 19 years. Coming home after 19 years. You want to say more about that, or you want to you want to just let that one happen? I, I I didn't think I was going to be able to look like you. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. it. We're much closer now than we ever were, and that's okay. great. Yeah. I uh, I smile because when I was uh, prepping for the sermon with my wife, and I, I said, you know, here's what the uh, with Erica, with the, with, you know, the idea where I'm going for, I said, what did you, you know, what's something that you signed up for that turned out very differently? Than, uh, <laughs> and she just looked at me. <laughs> and yet, a lot of those things come together. Your marriage, having kids, uh, moving back home, um, going on a retreat, uh, signing up for a program, a new job, Maybe a new sport that you tried out. Maybe the military might have been very different. So I want to, I want to share with you uh, something that I signed up for that, that was that was different. Was uh, starting in fifth grade, I thought I wanted to work in politics, um, and I wanted to work in politics so I could help people on a large scale. And um, after college, I got a uh, prestigious internship with the uh, Ohio State Legislature. And uh, disillusionment uh, soon followed. <laughs> uh, the official I was assigned to work with uh, was great. He, he's, a, he's an amazing man. He was focused on helping people. But the vast majority of folks that I came into contact with were content to be reelected re and avoid any costly stands or attempts at change or reform. The last straw for me was when um, my boss introduced a bill to uh, ban uh, capital punishment for people who were mentally retarded. This is a no-brainer, right? This was voted down in committee. I left politics soon after and haven't looked back. This was not what I thought I had signed up for. This was not what I expected. Did I waste two years of my life? 
I bring this up because I wonder if the feeling of being misled and disillusioned might help us to understand Peter and the disciples' response following Jesus' radical statement about the type of Messiah, the type of Christ that he was going to be. Up until this very point, Jesus has embodied what the crowds, what his disciples, and maybe what we have all hoped for in how a Messiah would act, right? How God will act for God's people. For the first seven chapters of Mark's Gospel, Jesus is helping people. And that's sort of what we expect a lot of times, you know, that, uh, again, when, when, when we sign up for this, that, that God's going to give us good things. That God's going to answer our prayers. That God's going to give us help. And this is what Jesus does. He teaches people. He forgives people. He welcomes people. He casts out demons. He heals people. He feeds people. And these are all the activities that Peter, the disciples, the crowds, and maybe you and maybe me would expect and long for from our God. Suddenly there is a dramatic turn from the popular expectations for a Messiah, for a Christ. What does Jesus declare this morning is his future and his plan for God's reign and kingdom? What does he say is going to happen? Say a little bit louder, Michael. He's going to get killed, right? Crucifixion and the cross. Death. Not just any kind of death. But the worst kind of death, a shameful death, a public execution sanctioned by the state. And if this wasn't bad enough, if this plan wasn't disturbing and troubling enough, Jesus is not just endorsing his own death, but he says, you all join me as well. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers and let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Anybody else out there like Peter uh, rethinking this whole discipleship plan? Can anyone really blame Peter for trying to talk Jesus out of the whole crucifixion thing? No, Jesus, messiahs aren't supposed to fail. Messiah should be successful. No, Jesus, the messiah isn't supposed to suffer and die. The messiah should live and reign forever. No, Jesus, messiahs shouldn't do what I want, what I don't want them to do. Messiahs should do exactly what I want them to do. The cross is a jarring wake-up call for Jesus' disciples then and now. That discipleship is vastly different from what they and we thought we were signing up for. What does Jesus' invitation and command for us to take up our crosses and follow him mean? Know that this is a huge topic and one that could fill a lifetime of, of, of study, of sermons, of Sunday school. So I'm only going to focus in on a small piece. I wonder if Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. I wonder if Jesus is trying to teach his <coughs> church how to lose. Think about it. Why might it be important for us to learn how to lose? How many of you out there have ever taught someone how to lose? Or how to be a good loser? Why was that important? You want to say? That's okay. You're, you're all right. Well, you're going to lose more, you're going to win in life. All right, so you're going to lose more than you're going to win, so you might as well get good at it. <laughs> right? Makes you a better person. Makes you a better person. Makes you empathetic. Makes you empathetic. A life lesson. If you can handle the worst, you can handle it all. If you can handle the worst, you can handle it all. These are all great.
great answer, and I appreciate you guys sharing. And these are all things that, are, that you know, I always write down what Mike gets said. And my answers were, you will. You will lose. There's so much emphasis in our culture on winning. It teaches us resiliency. It teaches us to be a good sport. Not to be a sore loser. It teaches us gratitude and graciousness. From our birth, and this is why I think it might be very important for Jesus to teach us and the church how to lose. Is from the very beginning, from our birth, every minute, every day, every year, we are losing. Do you see where I'm going? Every minute we are giving up our lives. Can we ever gain time back? Absolutely not. Can we win more time? Like in a video game? Absolutely not. The only real question for us as Christians is how will we lose our lives? How will we, we use the precious moments and gifts that God has given to us for such a short period of time? For what, for whom are we giving up our lives on a daily basis? And for the next eight chapters of Mark's Gospel, Jesus' teachings and actions will be focused on losing well. How does Jesus spend his life? He spends, you know, how does he spend his last days? He spends them caring for those who are seen as possessed by demons. He hangs out with little children who were considered next to worthless in the old days. Giving teachings that advocated for the protection of women. And he also spends time healing somebody with a disability who his own disciples tell him to ignore. Jesus spends his time with those considered by society and culture to be a waste of his time. Jesus spends his life, he loses his life for the weak, for the vulnerable, for the least of us. Jesus chooses to, live it, to lose his life while living out the immense love of God for this world. And this, my friends, is the path of discipleship that is revealed before us. Through our baptisms, we are invited, we are called to imitate our elder brother Christ. When we give up striving to, say, to, serve our, to save our statuses, to save our positions, to save our privileges, we find a larger life. We discover that when we aren't held bent on winning, on defeating, on succeeding, there is a greater and larger life, an abundant life, a godly life waiting for us. I'll let you in on a secret. Love, service, and sharing are threats to the rulers and powers of this world and, and are deeply, but yet are deeply rewarding to our souls. Never once, in my few years as a pastor, many times that I've sat next to somebody as they passed, no one has ever said to me, Pastor, I regret loving, helping, or giving to others. I want to end with a story. I had a... Uh, um, Dear friend of mine uh, passed away this last uh, this last fall. Uh, many of you uh, love him as well, Pastor Herb. Um, one of the things that I'll never forget about Pastor Herb, uh, you all know how sick he was. As he went through his illness, he started giving back. There, there were things he did around church for us. You know, there were there there were times that he filled in for me. There were times that. Uh, uh, that he, um, you know, he picked hymns, he, uh, he did visits, he, he, there, there were innumerable things that he, that he volunteered to do. And the, one of the last things that he gave up was visiting people. And I was always worried, I, was, I said, Pastor, you know, you're pretty ill yourself, you know, why don't you take a step back? And he said, he said Jim, it makes me feel better. 
Getting to lose my time with others gives me life. A couple days before Pastor Herb passed away, you know, where he was, you know, bedridden, he was still picking hymns for us. What I want to invite you all today is that you can begin losing immediately. Give up winning. Give up the idea of this, you know, this, this perfect life. And embrace what the cross teaches us. The cross points us towards a downward mobility, a giving away of ourselves. And I guarantee you that you will never regret loving, serving, and giving. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.